This is NTD Evening News. Live from our global headquarters in New York City, here's Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. For the second day in a row, explosions ripped across Lebanon as Hezbollah's handheld radios exploded. At least 14 people were killed and hundreds were injured. Entities Jason Perry has the details. Chaos filled the streets of Lebanon for a second day in a row as another wave of electronic devices exploded throughout the country. This time, Hezbollah two-way radios exploded, killing at least 14 people and injuring more than 450, according to Lebanon's health ministry. A Lebanese doctor shared his experience taking care of the injured. Of course, since patients began arriving yesterday, we saw the extent of the damage and wounds. We were working nonstop. I took my first break after 5 a.m. here in the office, and now I came back in the morning. And an electronic store owner in Lebanon shared his concerns about not knowing what could happen next. We had some devices here that we believed were 100% safe, but out of caution, we removed them from the store because we got worried. A Lebanese woman said she was not shaken by the second day of explosions throughout the country. For sure, we are not afraid. We are devoted to the leader of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and we stand with the resistance. Everything happening now is nothing compared to what we are willing to endure for him. My family, my children, and my husband are all devoted to him. Israel has not claimed responsibility, but many think it's behind the recent explosions in Lebanon. Israel's defense minister said this on Wednesday. I think that when you look at the current picture, the Israel Defense Forces have made excellent achievements, together with the Shin Bet Security Service and the Mossad, with all their units and organizations, and the results are very impressive. He also said the war is entering a new phase and that Israel is now shifting its focus to the Lebanese border. Also on Wednesday, the Israeli Air Force struck several Hezbollah targets in southern Lebanon. Nearly 100,000 residents in northern Israel have been displaced from their homes because of the attacks from the Iran-backed Hezbollah terrorist group. On Wednesday, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel will return the citizens of the North to their home safely. Jason Perry, NTD News. A huge blast today causing an earthquake-sized explosion in Russia. Kiev and Moscow have different explanations for the incident. This as tensions between the Kremlin and NATO keep rising. NTD's international correspondent Arian Pazdar has a Russia update. Eyewitness videos captured a huge explosion in Russia on Wednesday. The incident took place between Moscow and St. Petersburg. The blast was so powerful that monitoring sensors mistook it for a small earthquake in the area. An unverified anonymous Ukrainian source told Reuters the strong blast was due to a Ukrainian drone striking a Russian missile depot. The local governor in Russia, meanwhile, had a different explanation. Unmanned aerial vehicles were shot down and falling debris caused a fire to start. We are now evacuating our population. Russia says at least 13 people have been injured. Satellite images show the scale of destruction after the blast. Also on Wednesday, tensions between the Kremlin and NATO keep rising. The issue still is Ukraine's use of long-range weapons. Russian President Vladimir Putin previously warned that NATO would be crossing a red line by allowing Ukraine to use such weapons. In an interview with The Times published on Tuesday, outgoing NATO head Jens Stoltenberg dismissed Putin's warning. Stoltenberg says there have been many red lines declared by him before and he has not escalated. The Kremlin responded on Wednesday. His stance on Ukraine potentially striking Russian territory is provocative and dangerous. And lastly, in D.C., Marine Paul Whelan visited Capitol Hill on Tuesday night. The former prisoner spoke about his time in Russia. I was in a really remote part of Russia. You know, I used to call it Camp Lost in the Woods. I mean, it was really remote. Um, we, we really didn't have much. Uh, the conditions were poor. The Russians said the uh, poor conditions were part of the punishment. Wieland was held in Russian custody for over five years over espionage charges.
Arian Pastar, NTD News. One of America's largest labor unions, the Teamsters, declines to endorse a presidential candidate. That's as a survey released today shows most members favor Trump. Here's a look at the union statement today. The International Brotherhood of Teamsters declines to endorse a presidential candidate. The Teamsters are one of America's biggest labor unions with around 1.3 million members, including truck drivers, police officers, airline pilots, and construction workers. Union President Sean O'Brien explains why to Fox News. We were seeking commitments from both candidates, and we couldn't get solid commitments on our core issues like the PRO Act, like veto and national right to work, like staying out of labor disputes and not trying to force any contracts on us. This happened even though the majority of members say they favor Trump. An electronic poll shows nearly 60 percent want Trump as president, while 34 percent want Harris. A phone poll shows 58 percent for Trump, 31 percent for Harris. Trump reacted moments later. It's a great honor. They're uh, not going to endorse the Democrats. That's a big thing. And this is the first time in, I guess, 50, 60 years. This comes after union president Sean O'Brien was the first Teamster ever to speak at the Republican National Convention. The Teamsters are not interested if you have a D, R, or an I next to your name. We want to know one thing. What are you doing to help American workers? O'Brien said the Republicans have pursued strong relationships with unions over the past 40 years. He also says the Teamsters are not beholden to one party. Do I think it's going to make a huge difference in the end, even though they have 1.3 million members in a lot of key states like Michigan? Probably not, because people are pretty much already decided. Former congressional staffer and political reporter Dustin Siggins says polling data suggests that endorsements don't mean much in the modern era. Targeting voters in a blue state, former President Trump is rallying in New York tonight with a pitch about crime and inflation. It comes amid heightened security and reports of bomb threats that authorities say are false. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has the latest from Trump's campaign. Just three days after the latest apparent assassination attempt, former President Trump holding a rally in Long Island, New York, as he says he has real chances of winning that blue state. Trump lost by more than 20 points in New York in both 2016 and 2020. But Trump made a pitch to New Yorkers on Tuesday, saying hundreds of thousands of migrants, crime at record levels, terrorists pouring in, inflation eating your hearts out. I will turn it around. He also vowed to improve the state's economy by restoring tax deductions he capped as president. The event comes amid heightened security following the apparent assassination attempt on Sunday. The Nassau County Police Department said earlier that reports that a bomb was found near the rally location were false. House Speaker Mike Johnson today calling for more security for the Republican presidential candidate. We need Donald Trump to be protected, as any candidate of his stature would be. And on Thursday, Trump is participating in an event about fighting anti-Semitism in Washington, D.C. Reporting by Iris Tao, NTD News. And NTD's Chris Bob is at Trump's event on Long Island. Earlier today, Trump said on Truth Social that he believes he has a, quote, real chance of winning New York. Chris asked Congressman Anthony Desposito and former Congressman Lee Zeldin about this. Take a look. I think that uh, there's a very good opportunity for Donald Trump to have some of the best numbers uh, we've ever seen right here in New York State. Yes, you can. I remember at the end of September, two years ago, Siena College polling had me down 17 points. We ended up getting just under 50 percent of the vote. President Trump's right on the issues that are most important to New Yorkers. They want to have a secure border, safer streets, a stronger economy. And former President Trump is expected to start speaking at 7 p.m. tonight. We'll continue our coverage on NTD's Capitol Report, so stay tuned for that right after our show. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's Leadership Conference. She also got her own limited edition ice cream flavor. NTD's Jason Blair brings us the latest. Vice President Kamala Harris joined the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute on the second day of its 47th annual leadership conference on Wednesday. And growing up, our mother taught us certain fundamental values, uh, the importance of hard work, the power of community, and the responsibility that we have to not complain about anything, um, much less injustice, right? 
because why are you complaining about it, she would say, do something about it. She said she wants to lower the cost of groceries by taking on price gouging on behalf of large corporations. We've seen extreme weather conditions in California wildfires and other parts of the country, or even in the pandemic, where people are desperate because of these kinds of emergencies, desperate for support, and then some, you know, corporation, and it's very few of them that do this, but then jack up prices. This evening, President Biden is hosting a reception at the White House to honor the contributions of the Latino community to the U.S. Harris is also scheduled to attend that as well. Hispanic Heritage Month began September 15th and runs until October 15th. Then Ben and Jerry's are launching a limited edition flavor to help win support for Harris, they say. It's called Kamala's Coconut Jubilee. Sometimes the idea of going out to vote is a little dry. And, uh, you know, we find that when you add ice cream to most anything, uh, it's a lot better and more fun. Ben and Jerry's are also working with MoveOn.org to try to turn out more voters for Harris and Waltz, as well as down-ballot Democrats. As of now, the new flavor is not available in stores. Interested ice cream eaters must enter an online raffle for a chance to try it. Then the rest of the week on Thursday, Harris will participate in a live discussion event with Oprah Winfrey in Detroit, Michigan. Then Friday, Harris will be hosting a rally in Madison, Wisconsin. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Jason Blair, NTD News. Tech executives on Capitol Hill today pressed by lawmakers on how they are combating foreign interference with the 2024 elections. This comes on the heels of a Microsoft report that Vice President Kamala Harris's campaign is being targeted by Russia. NTD's congressional correspondent Melina Weiskup reports. Tech executives from Alphabet, Meta, and Microsoft on Capitol Hill today spotlighting attempts by foreign adversaries to interfere with American elections. One technique is using AI to generate and promote fake content online. I'm not sure any American, even a technology savvy American, is going to figure out that these are fake. Just this week, Microsoft has found evidence that Russian actors made fake videos meant to paint Vice President Kamala Harris in a negative light. We saw a Russian group put online an AI-enhanced video, putting into Vice President Harris's words at a rally, words she never spoke. There's deep fake content attacking a candidate for office, which can be demonstrated to be inauthentic, but cannot be decisively attributed to a foreign actor. How will you handle it? We would label it. Many tech companies have employed a fact-checking technique to prevent foreign disinformation. But in some cases, this policy has blocked access to debatable or even true information. The Hunter Biden's laptop, there was a story in the New York Post that was a concerted effort on the basis of that letter to silence a media outlet in the United States on something that actually turned out not to be a Russian disinformation. A uh, demotion of a few days was then uh, released and it was and it circulated. Did the, as fa did the fact checkers reduce or demote the 51 people who signed the letter or the letter they signed? Because that turned to be out to be not true. I, I don't believe they did so at the time, no. All right. And while many are focused on the presidential races, Senator Susan Collins said the local races are endangered. Briefings from the intelligence community that indicate that China is not focused on the presidential election race but rather on down-ballot races at the state level, county level, local level. Coordinated, inauthentic behavior networks conducted by China, some of them are quite um, specifically targeted at particular uh, communities. So TikTok, a platform that's ultimately controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, is the main source of news for young Americans. Notably, executives from the platform and from X were missing from today's hearing. According to a recent Grapica report, the Chinese regime is using social media to impersonate U.S. voters and exploit sensitive social issues to stoke division. Congress has passed a law to ban TikTok if it doesn't divest from China by January. The platform is now challenging the law in court. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Wisecup, NTD News. Interest rates are on the way down for the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, the Federal Reserve announced a much-anticipated rate cut. 
Here's Fed Chair Jerome Powell earlier today. This decision reflects our growing confidence that with an appropriate recalibration of our policy stance, strength in the labor market can be maintained in a context of moderate growth and inflation moving sustainably down to 2 percent. The Fed has cut the federal funds rate by half a percentage point. This is actually at the higher end of what economists were expecting. And the Fed suggested we can expect an additional 50 basis point cut this year with another full percent drop in 2025. This comes as recent job growth has slowed. The U.S. Central Bank had raised interest rates to their highest levels in 16 years to battle inflation. Inflation hit a peak of 9.1% in 2022. The Fed's interest rate broadly influences borrowing costs. That's anything from credit cards and car loans to mortgage rates. The House is voting on a stopgap bill right now, less than two weeks ahead of a potential government shutdown. NTD's Washington correspondent Luis Martinez joins us live from the Capitol. Good evening, Luis. What are Republicans saying about Speaker Johnson's funding plan? And the plan is to put, and they're voting on it right now, a continuing resolution with the SAVE Act attached. The SAVE Act would require proof of citizenship for uh, registering to vote. And the continuing resolution would just extend current levels of government funding for six more months, punting that funding battle until next year. Let's listen to what Senate Minority Leader uh, um, Mitch McConnell has to say of a potential shutdown if Republicans don't approve this plan. Be politically beyond sh stupid for us to do that right before the election because certainly we'd get the blame. And um, one of my favorite old sayings is there's no education, a second kick of a mule. We've been here before. Um, I'm for whatever avoids a government shutdown and that'll ultimately end up obviously being a discussion between the Democratic leader and the Speaker of the House as to how to process avoiding government shutdown. Well, this bill is now being voted in the House of Representatives, and we know that Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example, and Congressman Tom Massey have opposed uh, a continuing resolution just on principle because they don't agree with the current levels of government funding and want to see them reduced. Uh, so in the next half hour, we'll have the voting results, and we'll know if we're any closer to a government shutdown or uh, have a funding battle next year in 2025. And Luis, the House Freedom Caucus has a new chairman. How could this affect today's vote? That's right. Tuesday night, the House Freedom Caucus elected a new chairman. That's Representative Andy Harris, uh, the Republican from Maryland, only Republican in that state. Uh, now, it's very interesting because uh, Andy Harris is also a House appropriator. So there was uh, some uh, doubt on whether uh, Andy Harris would be able to uh, get the Freedom Caucus in line with this CR and the SAVE Act, despite them probably being known for wanting to reduce government spending. Let's listen to what Congressman Chip Roy from the House Freedom Caucus said about Andy Harris being part of the House Appropriations Committee as well. That will be a problem that he's in the Appropriations Committee and he might have to take decisions against leadership? I think I think it's a benefit. I mean, and we will have to, like everything, you have to work through every issue and work through strategy to try to achieve the objective. And um, we've been fairly unified as Freedom Caucus. Um, even in this kind of contentious environment over the CR plus save, we've, we've got all the Freedom Caucus aligned except for a couple. So. So this afternoon, I also spoke with Congresswoman Ana Paulina Luna, the Republican from Florida. She has never voted in favor of a continuing resolution, but told me that she was going to fall in line with the House Freedom Caucus leadership and a vote for this CR uh, with the SAVE Act attached. So uh, also, according to Chip Roy, only a couple of House Freedom Caucus members uh, have uh, stayed in opposition of uh, the speaker's plan. Uh, so that's interesting to see this new chairman during his first day already lining up 40 plus uh, members of the House Freedom Caucus. And Louise, on the flip side, what are Democrats saying about the funding plan? Well, Democrats are united in their opposition against the Speaker's plan. Uh, you have House Democrats who are not willing to vote for this plan because it has the SAVE Act attached, and they believe uh, the wording uh, uh, is against their policy beliefs, uh, despite it just being uh, requiring proof of citizenship for voting. And on the Senate side, House Major uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer has said that it's a non-starter, that they will not take a CR with any 
any policy writers attached. Uh, so we will see if Republicans can get this plan passed through the House and whether the Senate picks it up or whether the House is just forced to pass in next week a clean CR. Back to you, Tiffany. Luis, thanks for those updates. And Louise will continue to follow this story on NTD's Capital Report with Steve Lance. That's coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern right after our show, so stay tuned for further updates. The Chinese Communist Party's economy is tanking, but how is that offset by their non-market business practices? And what will happen if it's left unchecked? NTD's Washington correspondent Jack Bradley has more from Capitol Hill. Countering the Chinese Communist Party's technology sector, this was a topic of discussion at a panel on Capitol Hill on Wednesday. They discussed what would happen if the Chinese regime's unfair business practices were left unchecked. The U.S. economic thinking is really oriented around one thing, and that's allocation efficiency. The Chinese system is not oriented to that. They don't care about that. What they care about, first and foremost, is dominating advanced industries that are global and lead to power. The event was hosted by the Washington-based think tank Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. One of the panelists, Rick Switzer, the former director of the State Department, said the U.S. needs to create industrial policy that is self-reliant rather than sourcing globally or being outcompeted by China's highly subsidized products. And so if we wait for a world where the Taiwan invasion happens and then hoping that that will break us out of our stupor, it will have already been too late. A war over Taiwan will, will mean the uh, collapse of the U.S. industrial ecosystem. Keynote speaker Congressman John Molinar, who's the chair of the House Select Committee on the CCP, said he used to think that economic engagement with the Chinese regime would lead to more freedom in the country. But it turned out the opposite was true. And from the militarization of the South China Sea to unabashed economic coercion and market manipulation, uh, flooding our communities with fentanyl, the Chinese Communist Party has shown its true colors. The bipartisan House Select Committee on the CCP has released over 150 recommendations on how to counter the Chinese Communist Party. This may be one of the few areas of bipartisan agreement that we see in Congress. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. In March, a container ship crashed into the Baltimore Bridge, killing six people and destroying the bridge. The Justice Department is now suing the Singaporean owners of the ship. Entities David Lamb reports. The U.S. Department of Justice is trying to recover costs associated with the Baltimore Bridge collapse in March. It's now suing two Singaporean companies, Grace Ocean and Synergy Marine. They owned and operated the ship that crashed into the bridge. The United States States spent more than $100 million responding to this disaster to clear the channel and to reopen the port of Baltimore. Those costs should be borne by the ship's owner and operator, not the American taxpayer. The lawsuit claims that the electrical and mechanical systems on the ship were not properly maintained. This caused the ship, named Dolly, to lose power and crash into the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Six construction workers died when the bridge crumbled into the water. Two other individuals were injured. Prosecutors say the tragic incident was avoidable. The DOJ says the ship owners tried to exonerate themselves or limit their liability shortly after the crash. A spokesperson for Grace Ocean said the company had no comment at this time, but looks forward to setting the record straight in court. Dozens of federal, state, and local agencies removed around 50,000 tons of material from the channel and from the ship itself. The $100 million that the U.S. is seeking doesn't include repairs for the collapsed bridge. The state of Maryland may file their own claims for those damages. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Joining us now to analyze the Fed's rate cut is Thomas Savage. He's a research fellow at American Institute for Economic Research and a public policy analyst. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you here. To begin, this rate cut was long anticipated and the Fed cut rates by half a percentage point rather than a quarter. How do you read that? Why the bigger than expected cut? Well, that was uh, that was certainly surprising for many of uh, for many folks. My colleagues uh, over at the Sound Money Project had been debating whether it would have been a 25 or a 50 basis point cut. But it seems that Chairman Powell was fairly confident in economic activity, which is a bit worrisome. 
And what do you see as the impact of this on the economy? Well, as uh, some economists are saying, those uh, those rate cuts are already baked in. Mortgage rates had started to go down over the summer in anticipation of a rate cut. And the big question was, how big was it going to be? Um, so there it's, uh, you know, it could have a it could have a modest effect. But as research has shown, the effects of rate cuts like this don't really kick in until a couple of months. It could even be next year when we start seeing things really change. On that note, this is the first cut in over four years. The election is less than 50 days away and inflation in the economy is one of the top issues this year. Do you see this rate cut having an effect on voters? Um, usually, you know, voters seem to be seem to have their minds made up before Election Day about the economy. But, you know, it could be misconstrued as a political action. This is a huge rate cut, um, which uh, could help the current, which could help incumbents if it spurs economic activity. However, if uh, if the Fed overshot and they the rate cut was too large and they have to pull back, that's going to be a huge blow of credibility. And you're seeing it on both sides of the aisle. Democrats are saying the cut wasn't big enough and the Republicans are saying it was too big. So at timing a rate cut just before the election is bound to draw political fire from both sides. And expanding on what you touched on, historically, moves like this have helped the incumbent party during an election year. Now, some are arguing the politically independent Fed is not so independent this time around and is playing politics. What do you make of that assessment? Is there any truth to that? Absolutely. And it's it's an unfortunate fact. Research actually from the Sound Money Project has seen the Fed increase discussion of things like climate change and income inequality sit over the past 10 years, which has shown that mission creep is affecting the Fed just as it's affecting every other institution. And regardless of how viewers feel about those issues, the Fed has no business doing that. The Fed's main focus should be on stable monetary policy. And the only way to get politics out of the Fed is to tie it down with a constitutional monetary rule, not the discretionary policy that it has now. Hmm. Now, Jeffrey Tucker, president of the Brownstone Institute, argues that this is repeating the same mistakes that happened in the three inflation waves of the 1970s, saying inflation dies down, rates cut, inflation comes back, rates rise, etc. Do you think the Fed is making the right move? And how do you see their policies playing out in the long run? Well, that's, uh, you know, the, I'm, I would be more cautious if I were in Chairman Powell's seat. I would have had a more modest rate cut because I would be afraid of overshooting that. That being said, I'm not in the room. I'm not, you know, looking at all the information they have available. As far as affecting long term, you know, that's kind of the problem with monetary policy right now. There's so much of it that is a guessing game and there's so much left to, you know, left to guess. Whereas, again, if, you know, the Fed were tied to, say, a constitutional monetary rule, you would have greater predictability in what the Fed would do, regardless of where we were in the business cycle. And with that greater predictability comes generally more stability than we have right now. And finally, how do you see this rate cut impacting businesses, consumers, 401ks, et cetera? Well, we could see some asset price inflation coming in. Uh, um, ultimately, the Fed is hoping that this will spur some initial economic activity, but it's not something that's going to last forever. If you want sustainable economic growth, get government out of the way, have people keep their hard-earned money, have stable money so the purchasing power of their dollar is not getting eroded away, and reform regulations so that way it's not as difficult for people to get back to work, to start a business, and build, um, you know, build a life for themselves and ultimately build a stronger economy. Thomas Savage, Research Fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research and Public Policy Analyst, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. With the election season now in full swing, early voting is slated to take place in some states as early as this week. But do voters feel confident about our electoral system? Entity Sam Wong was out at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to hear from them. Early voting is happening as early as this week. By what means do you plan on voting this year? I'll vote in person on Election Day. I'll vote by mail. And, you? and I'll show up at the polls. I plan on going to the polls. Mail in. Uh, voting in person. In person. On Election Day? On Election Day. Okay. And how about you? Same, in person on Election Day. I am going to go to a polling place and vote early. Uh, we're going to vote probably in person um, within a couple of days of uh, the voting. We, we did request absentee ballots, um, but I don't know that I trust that this year, so I'd rather go in person. I'm not a big fan of the 
uh, doing it by mail or anything like that. I'd rather just get in there, look, and then touch. It just makes it so easy to vote in advance. In this case, since we're doing a lot of traveling around the election. Do you have faith in our voting system? Oh, I'd like to think that I do. Yeah, um, optimism. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what are the concerns? Uh, representation from who, where your votes are going to for the Electoral co College. Basically, yes, but I don't think it's 100 percent straight and narrow. I, I trust our system and I think it works and it's worked there for a long time. Now with all the uh, misnomers out there about uh, fraudulent ballots, I don't really buy into that. I mean, you could even look at what happened with Gore and uh, Bush. You know, what did it come down to? A few hanging chads and ultimately the Supreme Court made the decision. I have faith in my government. I think at a scale when you have hundreds of millions of voters, there's always going to be fraud. I think that's really hard to completely eliminate 100 percent. I think it's okay to have voting expanded beyond just the in-person option, um, but I think it should be within certain reasonable limits. Widespread mail-in voting, you know, if you just send everybody a ballot, you know, who knows if, I mean, do people still live at that address? Is it the same people still living there? How often do they actually update the voter rolls in every state? It's at a state level kind of thing too, so. I prefer there be a way to verify who you are the person mailing it in versus like, a dead person could easily get a ballot because they just passed away maybe three months ago, but they were still able to get a ballot, and then it gets turned in. But there's no way to know that. Uh, there's no way to safeguard against that. Pop icon Taylor Swift did not endorse former President Trump, but something that looked a lot like her did. As AI gets more common in the entertainment industry, California has passed a law that aims to protect performers from having their likenesses stolen. Artificial intelligence is increasingly becoming a staple of the entertainment world, and laws are catching up. Under a new bill, California has defined a digital replica as a, quote, computer-generated, highly realistic electronic representation that is readily identifiable as the voice or visual likeness of an individual. Another bill does the same thing for deceased performers and gives the right to their likeness to whoever holds their copyright. Only with their consent can a digital replica of the actor be created for commercial use. California Governor Gavin Newsom says the bills will help combat the use of deep fakes in political ads and other content. Newsom signed the bills alongside the president of SAG-AFTRA. The union has long been pushing for legal protections against the unauthorized use of AI to create actors, artists, and performers in scenes where the real person does not appear. AI has been used to resurrect deceased actors in films like Star Wars, Rogue One, or even recreate the voice of actors who have lost the ability to speak, like Val Kilmer in Top Gun Maverick. Maybe so, sir. But not today. Our New York City Mayor Eric Adams is hosting the inaugural National Urban Rat Summit, bringing together leaders from across the country to tackle strategies in the ongoing battle against rats. In today's Christina Corona tells us more. The first ever National Urban Rat Summit kicked off Wednesday at Pier 57 in Manhattan. Public work officials from Boston, Chicago and Seattle are attending the two day event, which includes presentations and discussions on rat control strategies. Uh, wow, I didn't realize we were going to get so many people showing up to talk about rats. You know? <laughs> Adams recalled families being traumatized by rats in their homes, stressing the need for stronger action against the city's rodent problem. You could only imagine, you know, lifting up your toilet seat in the morning and seeing a rodent come out. Or your garbage bag, you take uh, the garbage and put it outside and you see a rat run across your feet. You think about that all day. Event participants are working together to develop best practices for rodent mitigation and advance the science behind it. There will be a special focus on parks, sewers, construction sites, and public housing. These next 48 hours are part of a much larger dialogue, a, a centuries-long conversation between humans, their urban spaces, and the rats who have eagerly exploited them both. 
Commissioner Ashwin Vassan of the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene emphasizes that pest control is a critical aspect of health equity. He notes that rat infestations are unevenly spread across the city, so the department is now focusing its efforts on historically neglected areas. This holistic strategy includes rat indexing, a process that allows us to identify and address all of the properties in a particular neighborhood with rat with high rat activity and to ameliorate those conditions together simultaneously. He also says the city will engage the public through a rat information portal, which will provide current rat inspection results and follow-up actions. We're going to improve the health and the mental stability of everyday people in this city. So let's figure out how we unified against what I consider to be public enemy number one, Mickey and his crew. The summit continues through Thursday, which will continue to identify the rat hotspots and remove the conditions that allow them to survive in New York City. Christina Corona, NTD News. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, a lot going on today, but let's turn in the NFL, where former New York Giants quarterback Eli Manning was announced as one of the more than 100 nominees for the 2025 Hall of Fame class. Now, you've said he'll be an interesting candidate for the voters. What makes his resume unique? You know, a couple of things. One, he never led the NFL in a meaningful statistical category that you'd want to lead in. He did lead the league in interceptions thrown three times, but of course, that's a negative. Now, he is 10th all time, though, in touchdown passes, passing yards and passing complete passes completed but he played his entire career in a much different era no they changed the passing rules in 2004 to make it much more difficult to, for defenses to cover receivers that was just as he entered the league so it's not really fair to point out that he leads you know John Elway and Joe Montana in some of those statistics now some of his Hall of Fame candidacy is on his incredible durability I mean from 2005 to 2018 he missed just one game I mean in, for an NFL player that's remarkable he also has four Pro Bowl selections, which is good, but it's not necessarily a Hall of Fame great. His biggest claim to fame, two Super Bowl MVPs. I mean, the quarterback is the most important player in football. And for those two postseason runs, he beat, uh, I'm sorry, New England Patriots and Tom Brady for the Super Bowl both times there. Uh, personally, I think that's going to be enough for him, but we'll have to see. Well, staying in the NFL, the topic of Bryce Young's benching has brought up the comparisons between him and C.J. Stroud since they were both first two picks in the draft last year. Has Stroud's success impacted expectations for Young? You know, maybe so. I don't think that necessarily led to him getting benched. If anything, though, you would think it would lead to internal questions with the Carolina Panthers as to how they actually scout players. Now, not only did they choose Young over Stroud, who was a Pro Bowl as a rookie last year, the Panthers also traded two first-round picks and two second-round picks just to move up to have that first pick. Now, that's a lot of draft capital to get a player that a year later you're benching. So at this point, it's not looking like a good move all around. But there's plenty of hope. We've seen this season Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold get off to good starts. Those two were the first and third picks of the 2018 draft, but both eventually fell, fell out of favor with their own teams. But now this year, uh, Darnold is doing very well with Minnesota, uh, while Baker Mayfield is starring for Tampa Bay. So sometimes it just takes a few years. You know, quarterback is not an easy position, obviously. Moving now to college football, Wake Forest said they finalized a two-game series with Oregon State, which will replace next year's game against Ole Miss. Now, this move seemed to upset Ole Miss coach Lane Kiffin, who said they violated an unwritten rule. What is all at stake here? You know, for one thing, non-conference college football games are planned years in advance. Ole Miss was apparently just told on Saturday by Wake Forest that they were canceling next year's game. I'm sure they had to pay some fee to get out of it. But for Ole Miss, it's going to be tough to find a favorable opponent situation to replace them with um, on one year's notice. Now take for example Michigan and Notre Dame. Those two powerhouse programs announced in 2019, that's five years ago, that they had scheduled a two-game series to be played in 2033 and 2034. That's how far down the road they had to go to find some common open dates. And already the two coaches that agreed to that series, that's Jim Harbaugh and Brian Kelly, are no longer with the respective schools. Uh, so it's not always easy to find an opponent in the first place, let alone a situation that's going to work for your team. 
Shifting gears to the WNBA, while Indiana's Caitlin Clark has gotten much of the attention this year, Las Vegas center Asia Wilson is quietly having another MVP season. Yeah, she's already got the record for most points in a season, just over a thousand, first player to hit the thousand mark. And counting, you know, on Sunday, she, she then broke the record for most rebounds. She's now at 451. Now, it should be noted that she broke Angel Reese's mark, though, she said just a few weeks earlier. Reese, though, is out for the season with a broken bone in her wrist, but Reese still averages more per game, 13 as compared to the 12 that Wilson gets. Still, she's had a great season. She's going to be MVP this year again. Her team, the Las Vegas Aces, they are the two-time defending champions. They play their final regular season game tomorrow night against the Dallas Wings. Meanwhile, Caitlin Clark, of course, we can't forget her. Now, her Indiana Fever will play their final regular season game tomorrow night as well against the Washington Mystics. And then the playoffs will start on Sunday. Davis, always thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. And that's all for today's news. For around the clock coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.